Welcome to the Lifestyle Chase. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. Proudly hosted by me, Chris Little. Without further ado, let's get started. Welcome to episode 23 of the Lifestyle Chase with the one and only boomerang master, Ben Bosch. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. How's your day going so far? It's good. It's relaxing. It's day off today, so kind of chilling, catching up on some stuff. And despite this is like one of your low-key days, it's still a pretty busy one. Take us through what you did so far today. Uh, today, what did I do today? Uh, not much. Like in the grand scheme of things of my days, not much. Uh, I was downtown. I had a meeting to do. We have uh, an inventory control system that takes some maintenance sometimes. So sat down with our chef and the GM of that store for a little bit and went through some of that. Um, went to KB and Co to grab some breakfast and checked out Dosk, the new place on 104th. Um, just been meaning to check out all the new places. So I got some coffee there and then did uh, some work at the ranch. And then I'm here. Sweet, sweet. Now take us through a day of work. Oh man, like, <clears throat> I guess it depends on what day, because it's... Let's say it's one where you're doing like the morning portion. The morning portion, okay, so I'll take you through Tuesday, because okay. that's like, tends to be one of my more hectic days. Um, so Tuesdays start, I usually get up around four-ish, something like that. Because um, I like to, I don't like to like get up and, and fire alarm start my day. So I'll get up at four, um, kind of get my coffee, do my shake. Um, I have like a little morning routine. I do like the, the human charger uh, earbud things with the UV light. It's kind of cheesy, but it seems to work for me. Uh, I do like a little thing, a little morning routine with some burpees and a little yoga flow. It's like five minutes max, but it kind of gets me, gets me going in, in a good headspace. Do my shake, check my Instagram, try not to be on my phone before my food. Like that's kind of one of my things is like no coffee, no phone before I get some food in me. Um, and then yeah, shower, get ready, go to work, try and be there for six. Um, nobody's there yet usually when I get there. So it's not like if I roll in at like 6.30, nobody's like, hey, <laughs> like, <laughs> where you been kind of thing. So I get in there six o'clock, 6.30, try and get a head start. Um, and then, yeah, that's like entering invoices, um, checking on inventory, making sure we're set up for counts, looking through the logouts, because usually Sunday I'm off. Sometimes Monday's kind of admin, but I might not be there for a few days, so I wanna catch up, make sure everything's good. Um, and yeah, it's just a, it's a huge admin day. Like there's payroll, there's uh, all of my uh, invoices, my accounting, um, my inventory, my numbers, cost of goods, all that stuff. And then uh, we open the restaurant at 1130. So I open the restaurant, do front of house stuff for that. Um, and then, you know, just kind of support the floor, whatever, do bank deposits, um, run our weekly team manager meetings. And then I try and get out for three. She usually ends up like four or five o'clock kind of thing. Uh, and then <clears throat> I swing by central downtown on the way to the ranch because I do, we have like our, just our weekly kind of reconciliation sales stuff that I have to drop off. So yeah, usually Tuesday's like six to six, six to seven kind of thing. And that's it for my work day. Easy day. Damn. Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... How do you like find balance amidst like say the Christmas season? Cause that's probably when you get pretty busy. What, what do you do to keep your sanity? Honestly, I've kind of, uh, I try not to have a fatalistic, uh, outlook on it, but like December's crazy. It's just, there's no balance. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, maybe there's some restaurant op operators out there that I should be getting advice from, but there's no such thing as balance in December for me. Uh, it doesn't, it just doesn't exist. I have to work more. You have to work more as a restaurant owner. So December is already crazy. You have family stuff, plus all the bookings, plus you're just busier for, for walk-in volume. Um, balance to me is um, getting my little UV ear pods in the morning to get some sunlight on my brain, having a shake, and 
you know, getting an opportunity to see my wife before she's asleep. <laughs> That's a thing though. Like people overlook our habits that we put in place. Imagine what life would be like if you didn't do those three things. Totally. It would be a mess. I was just actually thinking I did a post today uh, in my story about supplements. Uh, so I started taking, I read um, Aubrey Marcus's book. And I know you're not a huge fan of it. But <laughs> um, I thought it was a good book, like coming from kind of a beginner, a general overview of things. Um, so I was like, hey, this guy seems to know his shit. I'll check out uh, his supplements. Went to Onnit website. And there's this, you know, total human supplement kind of regiment thing. So there's a day and a night. And I was like, I like the book. Um, you know, I buy into this guy's stuff. And uh, I was kind of raised in like naturopathic, hippy dippy kind of, you know, <laughs> household. So I'm like supplements, all, like they work. I know they work. I've used them before. So I tried them for, I'm in my second month now. And I'm like, I cannot deny that this stuff works. Like I am mentally sharper. Uh, I'm more alert. Like energy is more sustainable throughout the day. I'm sleeping better. And then today it kind of dawned on me. I was like, and this is December. Like December is the, the month that almost every year guaranteed I get sick. Like I don't get sick often, but it's when I wear myself out. And, uh, you know, I still feel a little bit of the post-holiday burnout, which it's hard not to. But um, like this year, I didn't get sick once. I was sleeping fairly regularly. Um, and yeah, I just felt good. Like my moods were pretty, pretty high most of the time. And it was just, it was a great December. So between you know um, shakes, uh, the UV light things, um, and the supplements, like I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, I got a pretty good routine started. So now it's just like, let's get back to the gym, let's get back to some workouts, um, and kind of build on that that foundation. But that's kind of the, at least I've got that foundation built. Um, so now that December's over, I can have a life again. Yeah, you can start building those those bricks on the wall. Totally. Um, take us through what high school was like for you. That's a question I like to ask of people because it kind of gives you some perspective of what they were and what they became. Sure. Um, high school was, high school wasn't bad for me. Um, I've been super competitive my whole life. Uh, grew up in a pretty big family and I was the oldest. Um, so I think I kind of always, I had that high, uh, high standard, like, even just implied, like maybe I made it up in my head, but I always thought that like I had to be the best, like I had to lead by example. I was always competitive, had to win everything. So by the time I hit high school, you know, I kind of had my growth spurt and like I was very athletic. Like I played, man, the only sports I didn't play in high school were curling and golf, like anything I could get my hands on. And I worked like three jobs during high school too. So I was like, go, go, go a hundred percent. So it was like, it was pretty easy getting along with people in high school just because through sports, um, you just make connections. Like you just automatically, even if, you know, uh, you're a socially awkward person or whatever, you play sports, you get to know people and you respect each other and you kind of build that camaraderie with each other. So socially, I uh, feel like I was in a pretty good place by high school. Um, I always got pretty good marks without studying, which was nice because I didn't like studying. Like <laughs> I had no time for it, made no time for it, and um, somehow I, I pulled it out. Actually, you know what? In This is my little humble brag right now because <laughs> I never really did anything with schooling after high school. Dropped out of post-secondary, but that's another story. Um, I got a letter of congratulations from the Minister of Education on my English and Social Diplomas. Because I scored like 96 and 98% or something like that. So that's like my one, that's my uh, academic <laughs> thing, my achievement. Yeah, that's good though. Um, so you'd say, you, would you be more of a jock or just you got along with everybody? Yeah, I definitely wasn't a jock. Like I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was like, um, like hanging people up on the fence by their underwear kind of thing. <laughs> But I wasn't, uh, by the time I hit high school, kind of the bullying was like those phases were done and I was like uh, a little more mature and more more personable and just made better connections. So I guess I was kind of like, I'd probably be a floater. I guess I'd be yeah. a bit of a floater, like just in all the social circ circles. I was at the parties, 
you know, through a couple of parties, but I wasn't like, you know, the, if I didn't go to a party, certainly nobody would be like, where's Vance? Oh my gosh. Like, yeah. where is Vance? We need to check on him. I have a funny story. So like my high school experience, I was fairly athletic, but like, I wasn't like the most athletic. I really liked gym class. There was one semester I was in like three of them. And when it came to parties and especially drinking, like, I don't think I had an ounce of alcohol until I was like exactly 18. And then it wasn't wow. until I was like 19 or 20 that I would like drink at a bar or anything like that. Like I had a rum and coke with my brothers on my 18th birthday in Leduc. Like wow. that was, that was my thing. Um, so everybody that would know me from high school, like if they saw me at a party, like even the grad party, they'd be like, what is he doing here? <laughs> But ironically, like one of my shifts at uh, Central, there was a girl that was there that went to high school with me and she like, looked over at me behind the bar, looked away, then looked again, then looked away, then looked again. And I think like between the fact that I've shaved off my head and everything, like <laughs> yeah. not head, but hair, um, she probably wasn't believing what she was seeing, Yeah. but it's just neat how like things change. Like, I'd say I'm more of like a, a health oriented person who likes a good beer mm -hmm. like i'm not like i've definitely adapted because i i find it helps me relate to more people mm -hmm. and i also enjoy uh relating to uh well my my hype man i don't know if you know who the hype man is yes sean okay. freeman the yeah hype well man. i always see you repost the stuff yeah well and then he, you went to the brick and he helped you out yeah sean's a stud he's a great guy he's a rock star for sure yeah and i like whenever i see a good non-alcoholic non beer i'll go check it out and tell him about it yeah because he's uh he's is he at a year now like he's I, been he's passed a year yeah good for going him going strong that's awesome my wife did the same thing i almost made it i broke a couple of times i think it's hard with uh tastings and and menu development and stuff for me yeah and that's kind of my excuse i also just like to have some beers well, so for I yeah, like, a couple of times, but I, I find that by like implementing non-alcoholic beer, like for for example, New Year's Eve, I just spent the whole evening having non-alcoholic beer, mm -hmm. and a lot of people didn't even notice the difference. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna go home. Kind of tired. They're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I just I pounded eleven beer, but they were all non-alcoholic. So yeah, <laughs> I mean, we're good. You're like, we're gassy. Peeing. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gassy, and we're peeing just as much. But <laughs> yeah, I can still see straight. Yeah, totally. And it's just I made really good use of the next day. I uh, went to a spin class. I went to a yoga class. I yeah. fell asleep in Shavasana. Mm -hmm. Typical day for me. As you would. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's good, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's um, when we did that year, it was very eye-opening. Um, I don't really drink much. Like it's just not a priority for me to to party and drink. Like being social is, you know, I don't I don't I'm certainly not jaded um, from the industry, but it's kind of like being social for me now is a job. Like it's I have to do it kind of thing. Um, it's an amazing blessing that my you know I've created this life that I can say that and and you know, sound like it's a job, but a lot of people I'm sure are like, what a, what a great problem to have. Um, but you know, going out, getting drunk, like it's, you know, being social and being sloppy are two completely different things. And to be real, like, I just, I don't have time to be hungover. Like I'm about to be a dad, like I'm about to have twins too. So, you know, to go from, uh, being a super busy, um, business owner that, you know, maybe I make myself busier than I need to be by taking on stuff. Um, but I, I just, I honestly, if I'm hungover, my whole week is shot because I have so much to do and I can't not do it. So I'm putting myself through the ringer and not getting sleep. And you know, you need to just like running a marathon, you need to recover from it's a marathon. Getting drunk's a marathon, right? Yeah. So your body is like dying and I don't have time to recover. So then I get sick and I'm like, man, I feel super 34 years old right now. <laughs> you know, I just don't have time for it anymore. Well, I mean, that's like very relatable for me because while maybe my whole day won't be filled as much as yours, I'll have like these crazy hours that I'm, that I'm up. Mm -hmm. Like on a weekend, I'll be up to like 4, 4.30 a.m., and then a weekday, I'll be up at 4, 4.30 a.m. Yeah. And, like, some days are packed full. Some days I, like, find a way to have a really good quality nap. And 
if if I was partying at bars, then that would not be sustainable. So, and that's just the way life has to be for me, which is great. Like I, I love what I have going on. I just think it's I contrast a lot of the people that I see. As far as your your family goes, you alluded to the fact that you had a pretty big family. So tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so there's four of us, four siblings. Uh, I'm the oldest, and um, my brother is two years younger than me my next uh, sibling is my sister she's five years younger than me and then my youngest brother uh, is 11 years younger than me so is it quite a spread um <clears throat> but yeah we're all pretty close um we don't like talk every day or you know we're all kind of there in Leduc and I'm in the far side of Short Park which it's a little bit of a drive so we don't see each other a ton um but you know when we get together it's like we try and keep in touch over the phone or, or, or text or whatever kind of thing. And there's there's no weird, like, tension that I know of. Maybe maybe they have a group chat behind my back or something. <laughs> but um, as far as I know, you know, we all get along and we all care deeply about each other and support each other. And um, I, I try not to be, like, the um, unsolicited advice big brother, but sometimes it just happens. It's just in me. Um so yeah, when we talk, it's like, it's kind of like just picking up off the last conversation, kind of like an old friend that you don't see in a while, but you have that, you just have that deep connection with. Um, I really feel like my siblings and I have that connection, um, even if we don't talk for a while, but it's like we get together and it picks right back up. So that's always nice. One thing that I've noticed, because <clears throat> like, you have to be pretty active with like all the, the social media and all that stuff when it comes to central. And sometimes I notice like a, a news company will call it like central social house or something like that. And I've seen that your brother has kind of yeah. like corrected it. I'm like, totally. what a good brother. I know. <laughs> he's always like, he's on it. And then he'll text me actually and be like, Hey, was that okay? <laughs> it's, it's like, I know you have to deal with the wrath of this shit. So like, yeah. is, is that okay to say? I'll take it down. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 that's good. Just shut up now, please. <laughs> like, you know, or like, you know, uh, I'll, I'll kind of even, even coach him a little bit or something like that on, on, on what he can say and what's offensive. And yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's, um, I don't run the Instagram, but, um, Jesse interacts with people on Instagram. I interact with people on uh, Facebook and then I do the online uh, reviews and stuff like yeah. that. So it's like, <clears throat> yeah, it can, it's goofy. I would never say anything on social media, but it's kind of funny that my brother and my cousin as well <laughs> both said something. I was like, sweet. There you go, guys. Thanks. Like, I'm not well, saying anything. Yeah. I mean, from an outside <clears throat> perspective, looking in, when somebody's really passionate about it, it kind of like, other people take on that passion so they can see how much this is important to you and they're like well if it's important to bands it's important to me mm -hmm. and so that is like for me looking in on it i'm like well this is a testament to how close his family is whether he says it in the podcast or not and i think that's really cool totally like when when i'm trying to get new clients and stuff if if i do a post like one of my aunts always shares it like my siblings share it, like my sister-in-law share it, like everybody's just like battling hard in the corners for Chris Little's fitness career. And it's the same for, for your stuff. And I think that's the importance of having like these families, whether we see them all the time, once in a while, but just like that support. We we can't undervalue the the importance of friends too, because sometimes our friends become our family, mm -hmm. but just that, that support circle. Yeah, for sure. Like that, that kind of, we've got your back type of thing. Like my granny shares everything central posts. It's That's adorable. amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm helping. Yeah. I'm like, I wonder how many followers she has or like, how, you know, uh, friends on Facebook, but it's super, it's awesome. Like, you know, I, cause I get all the notifications and it's like, oh, Ruth Drynan has shared <laughs> this post. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. That's, that's amazing. Crazy. Well, and the neat thing is even if it doesn't actually make any difference, like subconsciously it makes a difference with us. Mm -hmm. Cause when I was talking to Ryan Jones and he talked about like the impact of Twitter on a professional athlete, nobody's getting like physically hurt, 
Mm-hmm. But a chirp and then another chirp and another chirp and you're just seeing like a thousand of these a day mm-hmm. will drag somebody down, like whether whether they admit it or not. Totally. And so if if like grandma's sharing the post and you got mom and dad sharing the post, whoever's sharing it, like mm-hmm. that that's like the opposite effect and mm-hmm. you get a thousand of those, it's like we're gonna be all right. Yeah. Like Well, I don't remember what book it was. It was something I've read recently, but um it talks about how the emotional pain has very similar impact on on your brain and just your physiology as physical um, pain or impact or, or trauma. So uh, the I think the example was used something like uh, solitary confinement in jail, how inhumane it is. Oh, you know what? It was Jordan Peterson's uh, Twelve Rules for Life or something like that. Great book. The guy he's like an internationally re- renowned psychologist. Uh, the head of the psychology department at University of Toronto. He's from Cold Lake or, or Grand Cache or something like that. Um, so it was in the chapter about parenting, which obviously I'm very interested in right now. Uh, so it was talking about super controversial, like um, I can't remember how it got on the topic. It wasn't like he was, he was uh, it's a very thin line of discipline. It was on the topic, topic of discipline. It was like, well, what, like, is there, is it okay to, to discipline your children physically. Um, and he talks about how like, you know, your kids go off in the wrong direction and um, you know, they can be shunned by society or whatever happens. Um, talks about how in jail, like solitary confinement has very similar or even more impact on a person's brain and like trauma and just pain sensory and all that stuff as physical. Um, so they're like, and then he compares he compares things um, within reason. He's like, what is uh, what's worse, your kid getting you know a, a a flick on the top of his hand, uh, or running out in traffic in a busy parking lot somewhere? Like, what would you rather have? If like what needs to happen, kind of thing to to enforce that or make that stop happening? He's like by all means necessary but he's like that should certainly not be your first thing and there's different degrees obviously of um of uh, physical discipline and violence he's like we talk about hitting our kids as if it's that's what it is is hitting our kids he's like it's a big difference between um you know a quick um you know grabbing your your kid by the upper arms to get their attention or cuffing him with a back end, you know, like full force. He's like, there's a big difference between physical discipline. Um, I have no idea how we got on this topic. I'm it's sorry. all good. It's all good. Um, I want to talk about your relationship with each parent. We're going to talk about a quality of each that you like. We'll maybe say three qualities of each. Oh, three qualities. Should have studied. Um, okay, so my mom... So I was, uh, when obviously my parents were together, when they had me, um, so they were super young actually. Uh, so my mom was 17 when she got like knocked up with me, uh, finished high school. And then uh, I was born in October, so after the summer. Um, and they were together till I was like 15 or 16, I think, something like that. So I was almost done school. Um, And then that's when they split up. So, you know, I was like, I was raised by both of them. Um, But, uh, you know, my, my mom, I really have a a lot of, a ton of respect for the sacrifices that she, she made for, um, for our family. And, you know, growing up, we, we had some, some difficult uh, family dynamics and things and everybody does, right? Like, you know, I won't go into detail on it, but I really have a lot of respect for how hard she worked and the things that she sacrificed for us. Like she's a server. She's still literally serving um, and she's great at it. And it's something that she really enjoys doing and she can make a good income, not having to work, you know, 40 to 60 hours a week. Um, but, you know, doing that with kids at home, she's working till three, four in the morning. Uh, and then, you know, she misses out on a lot of things with us as well. Um, so she, yeah, just, um, the selflessness of my mom to be able to, to do those things and the sacrifice and her work ethic and, you know, how long she kind of held things together before it was like, finally it got to a point where, 
um, where she kind of made that decision where, where that was it. Um, selflessness, sacrifice, that's two things. You totally, <laughs> you nailed it. Okay, sweet. You got it. Awesome. I'm happy with you. <laughs> um, so my dad, uh, my dad, I would just say, um, his, uh, his humility, his, his ability to like, to, um, when, when the kind of the divorce and all that stuff happened, like he really, um, he changed, like he transformed. Like that was honestly, it's probably the best thing that's ever happened for him. Uh, he was able to completely make a massive transformation. Like, uh, he is a different person now. Like if you, <laughs> if you would have met my dad, uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago versus my dad now, like they are two completely different people. It is crazy. Um, but he is so loving, so gentle, so like caring, supportive. He'll drop everything, like every move I've ever made in, as an adult. And I've moved a fuck ton. Um, sorry for swearing. Um, <laughs> but I've moved a lot and, uh, he'll just like, he'll, take the day off work he'll go rent a truck he'll like everything he's there and uh you know anything like that he's super supportive um but just the just the example that he set of transformation and like um admitting that he, there's a change has to be made and you've got to stop and reflect and look deep inside and do like very hard work is i admire the hell out of that like it is um, it's really helped me recently in the last few years going through some big uh, transformations to yeah just stop and, and like look inside and get the skeletons out of the closet and you know it's um, really helped me live uh, a really like more authentic fulfilled life to be able to um, see that example happening um, took me a while to get there but uh, yeah I admire that I admire the hell out of that. And it's kind of cool, like, every person that I talk to about, like, their parents or their siblings or, like, somebody that's had a pivotal role in, in their upbringing, you can always see those correlations. Um, but now we're going to go to the, the rock-solid pillar in your life. How did you meet Morgan? Morgan? Uh, so Morgan and I met at my uncle's bar in Sherwood Park. It was called Encore Club. I think it's like a buffet royale or something now, but it used to be the, the Palomino. Uh, so he bought that with some partners um, a while ago. I guess it'd be like 12 years ago or something now. Man, it makes me feel old. So Morgan and I, Morgan was working there as a server. My mom was the GM there. Um, and I just kind of worked, uh, it was after a breakup. I, had, um, I was in a long-term relationship. So I moved out of there and then I was staying with my dad and like I needed money in between and all this stuff. So I just kind of picked up some guest bartending shifts there and I was working back bar and it was actually on her birthday that her and a friend brought in like, it was like the busiest I've ever seen that bar. There was like 200 people there. <laughs> so I'm at the back bar just trying to keep up with anger bombs. <laughs> like crazy. We have one special and, uh, she comes up and, you know, we'd kind of chatted briefly before and she's like, you're hot. I'm going to add you on Facebook. <laughs> I was like, okay, sure. Like, you know, working in the bar, you hear that stuff a lot. Um, it's true. You do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're like, you're drunk. <laughs> um, so yeah, she did. And we started chatting and the, um, the staff, like the staff party was a couple weeks later. Um, and we were chatting and she's like, just so so like just a genuine you know when you like when you meet somebody like that and you're like this is a real human <laughs> like there's no like this facade this like show of whatever and and all this stuff is like just not there like this is a raw this is a real human being um and she's just like what she does like she works with adults with disabilities like the work of a saint that she does it's like so impactful and she's just so so selfless and man like you know, I just, uh, my like pregnancy <laughs> hormones are getting to me. I'm getting, but like, it's crazy. Um, and, and within a couple of weeks, like we went on a date and, 
um, yeah, the rest is the rest is history from there. What was your first date? First date, we went bowling, and uh, we played the arcade at Old Reds when it was still still a thing. So uh, I let her beat me <laughs> at bowling, and um, we went down and you know played some games, won some tickets, got the got the stuffy or the teddy bear or whatever, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was super fun because I hadn't done that in a while. Like my relationship prior to that was very um, it wasn't very fun. Like it wasn't. You know, it was very, like we were trying to be adults when we weren't adults yet kind of thing. So just to like let loose and, and be real and just go have fun was, was, pretty, uh, was pretty awesome. Totally. That's awesome. I'm going to segue now. We're going to switch topics and then we're going to switch topics back. Okay. So when I was making my journey from like the warehouse job to the fitness job, it was kind of cool because you were like, honestly, probably one of the people that heard the most rants from me, <laughs> like long, long messages through Instagram. And like, we sort of, I think the first time I messaged you, I saw in your story that you did something where you like pulled out the hairs in your nose with the guitar thing, like a oh, stick, yeah. tar on the stick and you put yeah. it in there, pulled it out. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell <laughs> did that, did that work, man? You're like, Oh, it's like the first time I tried it. And like, that was our first conversation that I can recall. That was so random. The and magic then, of Instagram, hey? Yeah, and it just kind of grew from there. Because like, what I noticed is, because I think I was following Jesse, because his Instagram was pretty, like, as soon as you start following the fitness stuff, mm-hmm. it's inevitable. You're going to follow Jesse. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, you started following people first. And I was like, this guy followed me first and yeah. I followed you back because it just seems like the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, like what, what got me, I was curious about the nose hair thing because the guy wants to know how to get rid of the nose hair. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> yeah. And then I just kind of like, your stories were funny and interesting and then I can't remember what made me call you out to come to a spin class, but I called you out to come to a spin yeah, class. Yeah, you sure did. <laughs> you you came, Rob Clark came and we got the epic Step Brothers picture. Oh yeah, yeah that thing was so, epic. If anybody hasn't seen that, they can scroll through like about 400 pictures on my Instagram. <laughs> that was funny. That was a very sweaty photo and awkward to take, but it was funny. It was hilarious. <laughs> it was like, well, what are we going to do? And all of a sudden I had this pose and it worked. Perfect. So, but it's just neat because then from, from that point forward, it's just the bricks built and built and built and it's crazy what kind of like friendships you can get from from instagram mm-hmm. because when i was frustrated or stressed or i was like how, how am i going to make this work like how i've tried these jobs this isn't happening and then you'd usually like use some like personal experience and i was like, this is really helpful actually good i'm glad that's <laughs> helpful i try to like um it's just natural like being the oldest sibling i just kind of I always just offer advice to people and I'm honestly, I'm, I've tried to like scale that back because I feel sometimes it's a little bit too much, um, especially when you're, when somebody's trying to vent to you and share their experience. I don't want to come across ever as like a one or a one upper and be like, yeah, well, you think that's bad? <laughs> like, you know, the empathy versus sympathy kind of thing. Um, but I'm glad that that was helpful for you because I wasn't any of those conversations, I wasn't trying to like one up you and make my experience worse. I, I honestly was uh, just trying to give you some context and help you out. Yeah, no, it's always been good because I'm like, oh, well, and he's doing okay, so I'll do okay. Yeah. And that's always been sort of like a thing for me. Like, if, because you're, let's see, you're <laughs> eight years older than me because I'm 26, you're 34. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good math. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> So if something happens to you, if you're making something work, then I can kind of put myself in those shoes. Cause I'm like, well, here I am. Like I'm, I'm building up my fitness business, but I'm also working at a bar mm-hmm. and maybe the bar isn't like, it's, it sort of aligns with me in the sense that I see a lot of like trainers that I know and I've gotten some clients from working at the bar, which is great. Yeah. But like me being at the bar like two years from now might not be in my vision plan Mm -hmm. but then i see someone like yourself and you've had to work your ass off and made like lifestyle compromises just like things where it was like this is not really comfortable but this is for the greater good of the future yeah and just situations where like i think everybody that that wants to continue the population of earth has some kind of plan for a family of some sort. And even if it was 
just somebody that just wants to own a lot of dogs, so be it. Mm -hmm. But even for myself now, like sometimes I'm like, I should get a dog. I'm like, nope, can't support a dog right now. Yeah. Got to get my life to a place where I can support a dog. But then there's like the aspirations of like, maybe one day I'll get married. Or maybe one day I'll have kids. Yeah. And you had done so many posts about like starting a family or having a family. It was always like implied. And I was like, he totally wants kids. Mm -hmm. And when, when you posted that you actually, you're having twins, I was like, yes. <laughs> awesome. The same reaction, except way more tears for me. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. And then Jesse too. Cause I'm like, I know there, there's another crazy? person. I'm like, okay, he's just like somewhat future Chris. Like we go down different paths, but you're both easy for, for me to, to relate to in some way. Cause we're mm -hmm. both like passionate about what we do. Yeah. And we're kind of like interested in taking care of the people in our lives. Mm. And so on that note, like talking about the twins, like what were the three emotions that went through your head when it happened? Like when you knew that finally it was going to go down, like you're going to, you're going to be a dad. Mm -hmm. Oh man. The f like just pure joy. Like just like the most, uh, like I'm going to start crying right now. <laughs> like just so, um, like relief, uh, just so much pressure, I think that I'd put on myself and um, just, you know, cause in the whole, um, the whole fertility situation, I'm not shy to share this. Like it's my, my stuff wasn't so good, you know? So um, uh, Morgan's tests were amazing and the doctors were like, yeah, like, I don't know what's wrong because she should be able to have perfectly healthy and, you know, carry and conceive and all this stuff. Um, so it just like, it felt like a big failure on my part. Um, <clears throat> and I talked about this, I did like a big post about it too, but I felt like it was important to share because, um, I really, I got in this bad place. It was probably one of the worst emotional places I've ever been. Like, you know, I, I don't think that I was ever like seriously considering suicide or anything like that. So, you know, I can't make it, people were in worse situations than I was, but, um, Certainly, like it was not me. I wasn't myself for a while, um, and I was just really hard on myself. So, sort of to have that news, especially after the work and the roller coaster, and you know how badly Morgan wanted it, and I know my family and all that stuff, and her family. Um, it just like joy, uh, relief, and um, I was just so excited and so proud that we had gone through that um, that experience together. And that kind of thing, you know, you read about it a lot. It breaks up a lot of, uh, breaks up a lot of marriages and relationships and going through that together. I just, I really feel like if anything, it just made us stronger and, and, you know, kind of more together. Um, yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. And I think it's important, like part of the, the brand of this podcast is just to make people more resilient and strong. Like. We're not selling ebooks or anything on here. Yeah. And a lot of people are going to be in that situation. Like, I think of myself, like, what happens? Like, I'm not going to have a kid next year. It's probably going to be when I'm in my mid 30s or something. Mm -hmm. What happens if I was in the same situation? I was like, man, like, I'm the only one this happens to. And this just, I'm in the dumps now. Like, it's so important to tell people stories. Yeah. Because I think of myself and I'm like, if future Chris gets in this situation, future Chris wants to know that he's, he's not alone kind of thing. Yeah. Do you think anything sort of, was it like a stress that contributed to it or you just drew the short straw? Um, that, yeah, I'm sure like stress, um, my, my just the highly demanding workload and schedule that I have created for myself, um, that is maybe unnecessary. Um, geez, I don't know. I was like, I went through a pretty big partying phase. So I was like, you know, I, I consider things like that. Like, you know, especially when you're going through the dumps of it and you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, I did this to myself, like what an idiot, you know, all this stuff. Like I'm not, you know, those thoughts of like, I don't even deserve to be a dad. That's why this is happening to me. Like all this stuff. Right. So, um, you go back and you retrace everything that in your mind like contributed to why this is happening to you um and i i couldn't pinpoint what it was neither could any of the doctors or anything like that um but 
it's just, yeah, it's an absolute, absolute miracle uh, and blessing that we're not only having one, but two. So it's, that's what I'm focused on is totally, is it, that's totally incredible. I think that's the important thing to focus on. It's just like, we, we can't change what we can't change. Mm-hmm. And I think everybody's going to get, like, everybody's life is an up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Everybody's ups look different. Everybody's downs look different. Yeah. And so if you just, like, settle with that and don't dwell on that, then we're good. Yeah, that's what makes life worth living. If you don't have that, if you just got, if there's just, like, a constant, everyone got the same kind of handout, the same thing, and you're, you're, everything was, you're always happy, you wouldn't be happy. There's no, you can't always be happy because happy only happens because sad happens. Like, there's no, yeah. there has to be that ebb and flow of life. And it's, it's, <clears throat> I think, just kind of something for me that I've, really bought into recently that I've always, you know, kind of heard and, you know, I've got people in my life like Amber Campina, Jesse's wife, um, uh, Ashley Milky, who's um, somebody I've worked with in the past. And just like yeah, really positive people that have taught me uh, about acceptance and, and you know, uh, suspending judgment and not making things bigger than they are. Like, um, I've always kind of had that understanding and it kind of clicked for me recently after all this stuff happened <clears throat> that everybody's going to go through shit um, but you just have to kind of accept that like you know even as minor as traffic like you know road raging is something that I'm working on for myself because <laughs> I'm you know, I'm can be a bit of an aggressive person um, so I just you know I've, I've literally had to stop myself and say I am in traffic. This happens. Yep. This is happening. You know, it's not good or bad. It's, it just is like, that is what is happening. Interesting. You know, like saying things like interesting. Oh, that's interesting. You know, instead of like, get on my way, you know, like it's just, yeah, I just got cut off. That happened. I'm alive. I'm well, I'm still on the way to my destination. It's funny that you like say it like that because uh, one of my trainer friends, Anthony Harder, he finally gets a shout out on the podcast. Um, one of the coolest things of the many things that he's taught me was to like talk to your clients about traffic. Like you're in traffic. If you get all like fired up and then you walk into your session and like your your shoulders are up to your ears and veins are popping on your forehead, like how good do you really think that session's going to be? Like, how much like muscle activation do you really think you're going to get? Like your, your range of motion is going to be affected. Your central nervous system is not going to be what it could be. Like just relax when, when you can't change the time that you're going to arrive at your session, just get into a good space for the time that you're in traffic Mm -hmm. and do what you have to do to fix the the next situation. Don't let it like stack on and stack on and stack on. Mm -hmm. And in the same sense, when, when you're running a session, you don't want to like put somebody through something that puts them in a state of shock and then boot them out the door. So like something that I try to implement and I think a lot of great trainers in the city do the same is like if, if you're having them do something that's like high demand, physically demanding, you, you get them to work on maybe some, some mobility stuff to sort of leave them with a, a feeling of ease and it makes the, the fitness session a little more sustainable where they associate their time, their session in the gym with like, ha, I'm, I'm good now. Like yeah. I feel strong, but like at ease and in my Zen, like the Buddha's around the corner. We're good. Totally. There's no bears, <laughs> Yeah, but it's such, it's, it's simple concept, but if you actually apply it, like it makes clients so much happier. Yeah. Because they're like, every time I leave my session, I feel happy. Mm -hmm. Huh. And then if you keep reminding them about traffic, like, I just, I can't say it enough. I'm like, if you're on White Mud or Henday, just go, ha. And like, that was something that came from Anthony. So I have to give him credit, but I use it all the time Mm -hmm. because clients start doing that. I start doing that. And anxiety drops dramatically. I'm just happier. And it, when you're late, you just communicate you're going to be late, and most people are going to understand. We've all been on the exact same roads. We've all gotten lost at least once. Mm-hmm. Some of us, like myself, I get lost a few extra times, but it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> but just these these simple things. On our next little uh, topic jump, you've talked about living out of a car many, many times. Okay. <laughs> so I'm like, 
what is this story? Like, what were you doing? What was your job? What, what was life like then? Uh, blurry, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was, uh, that was a, a rough time, Trans- transitional period in my life. Uh, so I honestly couldn't even pinpoint a lot of things that happened in that timeline. Um, there was a lot of partying. There was uh, some illicit drug use. There was uh, lots of different people in and out of my life. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I moved around a lot, did, um, you know, stayed on people's couches. Um, I lived out in the mountains for a while. I worked for Fairmont, which was a super cool experience to kind of learn that fine dining side of things. Um, moved back and uh, yeah, it was like kind of, I might have been working at it at the time, probably in some bars. Uh, my buddy and I had a pub crawl company at one point. Um, I was in post-secondary school for architectural technology at some point because I was really good at that stuff in high school and in options. Uh, what was it called? AutoCAD, like a drafting program. I actually went to the Canadian skills competition for it. So I had a knack for it, but I didn't like it. So I like dropped out. Um, but it was just, yeah, it was in between times where I didn't give a shit about anything. Like my main concern was um, partying with people and like, you know, meeting new girls every night. You know, like that was like my biggest focus in life was very self-destructive um, nothing productive nothing moving myself forward no sense of planning execution like it was just fly by the seat of my pants and yeah there was there was periods multiple periods of a time where if i couldn't stay on a couch in i had a 1984 civic hatchback that uh the lock on one side didn't work so i actually had to bend the window back to get in sometimes (laughs) it was awesome but the the seat folded back and I had like a little foamy mattress in there. And uh, even when I wasn't living in my car, I would still had it um, for, you know, convenient situations sometimes. But yeah, there's, there's uh, short stretches where I was living in the car and showering at the gym or wherever I could and just kind of making it happen. Like it was not, it wasn't like a sacrificing for the greater good inspirational story. It was like, man, this guy's a mess, <laughs> like he needs help kind of thing. And uh, I don't really know what got me out of that. I think it was a, it was a long-term girlfriend kind of like forced Smacked me. You in the head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like it wasn't a very healthy relationship, but it was the one I needed. You yeah. know what I mean? The timing couldn't have been better because she was very strict and it was like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> so it got me out of that life, thank God, because I might not even be here. Um, but but uh yeah just different that was a different advance different time for me for sure well it's crazy because i'll tell you right now like nobody <clears throat> that knows you would would even guess like they they would see you as like a clean cut really ambitious business professional mm-hmm. so to know this is good mm-hmm. i and still had you know and honestly i still i still had just as much ambition but it was my focuses were my priorities were all wrong. My ambition was uh, getting more girls, um, getting more opportunity to party, um, you know, being just more involved in whatever that scene was. And, you know, I was very, I was successful at <laughs> those things my priorities were, uh, but they were wrong and just the direction was just different. Um, so, yeah, same, I guess, same like core. Uh, attributes, maybe principles and direction, just way different now. Yeah, totally. And it's it's not like rare for for myself. Like I've always been somebody that cares about people and wants to wants to sort of build a community or, or get lots of people together. Mm-hmm. But I just haven't always been in in settings where I was going to be able to make that happen. I haven't been in settings where that was conducive. So there's been plenty of different versions of, of Chris too. And when people don't see like where people have come from, then they just think that they just got it, like that, that it just came to him. Yeah. They don't understand like that they're going to need to put in work to to get what they want out of life. Oh yeah, you gotta jump off the edge. You gotta, man, like you, like reinvention. I talked about this with my dad. Um, it's like, it is crazy hard work to like 
stop what you're doing and and really um yeah just like like stick a wrench in it you know stick in the spokes kind of thing and just like reinvent and do the work and look inside and um just the process of like refocusing yourself of of finding what's really important and and aligning with your principles is is very hard work um but probably the most important thing you can do because now i can kind of you know not live on autopilot like i don't want to take it for granted but now like i'm so clear on kind of the direction that i'm going in life and what's important to me um and values and principles and things like that that i don't even have to articulate it it's just everything that happens around me kind of goes in that direction like my decisions i don't have to think about decisions anymore they just happen like i just i can make calls on the fly because i just i am for the most part of course everyone strays in different directions once in a while but for the most part i am so focused and moving in one direction that just there's just this uh you know it kind of everything gets sucked into moving that direction that's around me as well i think a big part of it is your your in your pursuit of genius you're you're doing something that utilizes all of your best qualities and by doing that you're going to have other people that want to help you and it's just going to come a lot easier whether whereas if you were in something that you could be excellent at and i think i'm quoting this from somebody's book probably mm. but uh if they want to know i can i can dm them the link to the book but um just being in that area where it was uncomfortable to get there but you got good at being uncomfortable is going to make you more consistent and make it more sustainable which is great yeah i think a lot of people are scared to get to that point in their life yeah where like they they had to make a sacrifice or they had to really have like a ground shaking revelation of like hey this isn't working we got to change things up mm -hmm. but when they do that when they get really good at being in their zone of discomfort then they they wouldn't have it any other way yeah it's like it's the amount of opportunity that opens up outside of your comfort zone like if you can if you're looking for that if that's where you're hanging out is outside of your comfort zone there's just like immensely more opportunity i can't even like that is one of the biggest game changers for me is just one of my old Earl's managers, I think, Colin Corbett. He lived in Calgary, probably not listening. But <clears throat> anyways, super influential guy. Um, and he always talked about the circle of concern and the circle of influence. Um, circle of um, influence was smaller. It was the things that you could impact directly. Circle of concern would be a little bit bigger. It was things that you might worry about, but you can't do anything about. Um, so the idea was to keep chipping away and keep pushing the edge of the circle of influence, um, you know, live outside of the edge, uh, you know, make yourself vulnerable, try things, um, aim to fuck things up. The more you fuck things up, the more you're going to learn and you're going to, um, maybe not be good at that thing, but it opens up another opportunity or somebody sees that you are brave enough to try something and they want to coach you and help you out and do things like that. So kind of the goal was to if you can make your circle of influence uh as close to the side size of your circle of concern as possible that's like you know that's a great pursuit that is a worthy pursuit in life is to um things that you're concerned or worried about or could affect you if you can have more influence over them why wouldn't you do that you know just all of the opportunity all that it's worth fighting for in life is going to come at at some kind of uh, sacrifice whether it's you know physical emotional um, looking good to other people or whatever it is uh, if you can kind of suspend that um, just that fear and that thought or get used to it get it, I get excited about it like having twins everyone's like aren't you scared I'm like no I am so excited to be way outside of my comfort zone like I I, I crave that kind of experience now um, yeah, just like to be able to get out and do something different and crazy and something that I know I'm not going to be good at. Like I like doing things that I know I'm not going to crush. Like I want to do that. Like I want to learn it and get better at it. Um, and again, I went off on a crazy tangent, but I think we were talking about <laughs> creating opportunity and it's it's only in the discomfort zone. Yeah, Opportunity does not live in your comfort zone. 
Totally. You nailed it. We're going to jump topics again. We're going to like bounce around like Tigger. Just like my Ooh. random <laughs> <laughs> thoughts. So I want to talk about the upcoming twins. And because it's something that you're passionate about, something that lights up your eyes, it's cool to see. Sure. What are three things that you're going to do the day that they're born? Uh, the day that they're born, I'm going to... A, take the day off, <laughs> like really take the day off. Yeah. Like my, uh, um, you know, I can't say my phone's going to be off cause I got to Instagram that shit, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, just boomeranging. No. <laughs> One, the other, the other. Yeah. Imagine that's <laughs> awkward. I won't do that Morgan. I promise. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, be off work and be really present and in the moment for it. Uh, I really want to experience that. That's one of my intentions. Uh, I'll give Amber another, another shout out, but she's always got great posts about like, what are your three intentions? Let me hold space for you. Um, and yeah, mine were presence, uh, building a family and something else. I can't remember what it was. Um, but yeah, I, won't, I really want to be present in that moment. And I know that in order to do that, I have to kind of plan ahead. So um, I will make sure that, that everybody understands that I am, unavailable that day. I think everybody will understand yeah exactly <laughs> that's probably more in my head yeah <laughs> worrying about people like I wonder how the store is doing you know or how this person's doing um <clears throat> another thing I'll be doing on the day or what did you what was the question I'm so sorry three things you're gonna do the day that your your kids are born I'll probably cry a lot I'm like I'm getting soft in my old age like I used to fight kids in the bar and like you know just be super like douchey after like in my bar party days and it was like you know i would never be caught dead crying in public or at a movie theater or something like that and i cry in commercials now like it's, <laughs> i'm getting soft so yeah i'll be present i'll be crying <laughs> and um yeah i'll just be i'll be super proud as supportive as i can like uh it is amazing what morgan is going through right now and like you know i talk about how she's a saint and like to be able to create life in your body and like and uh and carry and um you know deliver it is just like it's mind-boggling you know like when you it just happens in life so it's just for me it's always just something oh yeah that happens like somebody had a baby that's cool good for you you know i guess we'll be nicer to you or something right but now that it's happening it's like holy shit this is crazy like this is it's amazing like it is a miracle of what is happening um so you know i'll be as supportive as possible i'm already you know kind of subconsciously just doing way more stuff around the house and she's like thanking me i'm like oh am i doing more like <laughs> i guess i'm just doing it now so um yeah i just want to be as supportive as possible um and whatever whatever the family needs you know what i mean that's um i'm there what do the dogs think of the situation? <laughs> they're, I don't think they're really aware exactly what's going on. Morgan's exhausted, obviously. She's growing things inside of her. Um, so she's like, she's tired, which I think they're relishing in the fact that they get to cuddle mom more. <laughs> so <laughs> lots more snuggles. Um, she hasn't been moody at all. Like it's, it's amazing. I don't know if that's like, maybe happens later on and I've just cursed myself, but um, yeah, she's been, a, she's been great, super positive, really happy. I think we're just both so grateful for, for this opportunity finally happening that like, that's kind of overshadowing potential mood swings maybe. Um, but yeah, the dogs are, I don't know. I'm curious to see how they do too. Have I kind of want to see around kids before or yeah, they've been around kids. Like we have nieces, um, and trick or treaters. Like they like kids. They like, they're just really affectionate. So yeah. They give tons of kisses, so kids that aren't used to being around dogs all the time are kind of like, holy shit, like, kid, what is <laughs> happening? Because they can be a lot. Yeah. Um, but they're just tiny little dogs. Uh, I think they'll be very affectionate. They'll be very um, loving and probably pretty protective, I guess. Yeah, I know, like, the way I see it, I'm like, that'll be a pretty neat little family. You have, like, a dog-to-kid ratio and... Everybody's got each other's back. And then anybody tries to mess with the dog, kid's got dog's back. And anybody tries to mess with the kid, dog's got the kid's back. Totally. So 
You're good to go. I really want to um, like saddle up the dogs. <laughs> like at some point, I feel like there's got to be a good weight ratio where it won't hurt the dogs <laughs> for I photos or something. You probably got like a one day window, and yeah. then the kids are too big. As soon as they're out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bring them to the hospital for the photo op. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's awesome though. <clears throat> So now we're at the last question. This is a question that everybody gets. If you were to give one piece of advice to our listeners on how to authentically live your life to the fullest, what would that piece of advice be? I got to say, um, it's kind of, I guess, a combination out of some of the things that I have been talking about today. Um, but just like really being able to, I think it's important for everybody to just stop what they're doing and really reflect reflect and dig in like do the work like go to the places that you don't want to go or you don't think you have to go like um, do the healing do the meditation do the yoga be with yourself like dig deep inside um, and find out what is really important to you Um, you know I, I I kind of grew up we moved around a a ton so I I never really belonged anywhere until high school we finally settled down Um, so I was always kind of like you know maybe I'm with this crowd or this crowd or whatever so I think growing up that kind of molded me and maybe that's why I went through that bad phase where I just got sucked into a bad uh, time in my life Uh, but it wasn't until I was quite a bit older like almost in my 30s where I really like stopped and like Uh, spent the time and did the work and just broke down and broke through all that stuff and unpacked all this baggage and um, I just think it's so important that that people do that and find ways to to make you know consistently do that and um, you know find out just do the work to find out who you are and just be that person it's gonna you know that the truth will set you free kind of thing so dig through find it find what your principles are align yourself in that direction and just go perfect i love it well thanks for making time for me and hanging out today absolutely it's awesome man thanks and we'll, we'll see you around soon i'm sure sounds good